I'm with you, team one. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so uh, we wanted to do this as a conversation for a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we work together, so we actually see each other every day and we talk about uh, you know, culture and creativity in this city a lot, but we don't get the chance to always kind of to, to uh, well, I don't get the chance to ask you about, you know, how it all began and the, the things that kind of motivate you. Um, so that was one reason just to, just to kind of uh, make, a, make this a conversation. The other is that, you know, with this topic of, of roots, and this does kind of, I think, inform the work we do together and, and you know, the work we do here at the ICA, is that you know, we come from really different places. Indeed. Uh, and in fact, you know, as we're gonna, as, you, know, you, you know, you're gonna talk about with us right now, I mean, the, the fact of you coming from this city matters so much for what you continue to do. You know, and for my part, I'm not from here. I moved here a year ago. And in some ways, I'm not really from anywhere in particular. Mm. <laughs> so, so that idea of, you know, some, some people are really from somewhere and that matters and, some, and have those roots and some, some folks do not. Yeah. And that's, that's, that gives, you know, gives you a really different perspective on, you know, uh, what culture and creativity means. So, you know, so we talk about the present and what you do now a lot, but this is a chance to go back to the beginnings. And uh, so, uh, you know, you've... I mean, Africana is mentioned up here, and we'll get to that. Yeah. Uh, but it's really one of many things you do in terms of, um, you know, uh, representation in this city and culture. So maybe we should ask you about the, the earliest inspiration and background for this. Well, it all started in 1979. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, I say that jokingly, but the truth is that I think that my upbringing um, has a lot to do with where I am now. So I'm Richmond's own, born and raised here, grew up in the West End. Yep. Uh, I'm a TJ Viking. All right. Yes. All right, Mary. <laughs> um, and so much of uh, my life growing up. Um, was, was I was really active in the city just kind of organically because of my father, just my family's kind of presence. My dad was, he was a musician, but he was also like in the political sphere. He was an activist. He did a lot of work in the social sphere. So very organically, um, I would just was connected to the things that were happening in the city. And those things began to inform me in a way that I wasn't really aware of. Um, and so as I got older, um, I went to, you know, graduated from TJ. I went on to Virginia State for a while. I didn't finish. Um, and ended up working at this place called Croker Spot. Yes, who, yes, who in here has been to Croker Spot? Yes, show some love. <laughs> Uh, and so Croker Spot, uh, for those who don't know, is a black-owned restaurant here in the city, but it's a part of about a 100-year legacy. Uh, it was started by Never Eggleston uh, Sr., uh, passed down to his son and then to his grandson, Never Eggleston III, uh, who really began, he, through working there, I started working there when I was 20, and I was there for 10 years. And over the, those 10 years, I was under his tutelage. And this idea of black entrepreneurship, um, social entrepreneurship, and the elevation of black culture through the work that you do uh, became very real to me. I, I saw these things synthesized in a way uh, that I hadn't really seen. And so I was able to take like this foundation that my family had given me uh, through the work that my father did, through the work that my mother did, um, and see how all those things could come together in a creative way. Uh, and so I would say that Kroger Spot really helped to fortify the foundation for the work that I do now. Um, was there for 10 years. Ended up leaving there just because if anyone has ever worked in the restaurant space, 
you know it's a real situation. <laughs> and uh, burnout is a very real thing. And I got burnt out. You know, I had a child. I worked many hours a day, many hours a week. Um, and it just got to the point where my spirit was like, okay, it's time to move on to the next thing. Uh, it was a very scary transition because I thought I would be a croaker spot forever. I love the people. I love the place. Um, I love what it represented. Um, I love the fish. Um, <laughs> um, but um, in you know, taking that step, not really knowing where I was going to land, uh, I ended up like working a nine to five job that I totally hated. I ended up coming here to VCU to study sociology. And it, within that time, Africana just came. I don't have a background in film. I, didn't feel like I was qualified to even do it, but the vision was very, very clear as to what to do and how to do it. Um, you know, when you think about roots, um, when I take it back to the Croker spot, it was really never it who convinced me to do it because I was ready to like hand it off because like I'm not qualified, no one's going to trust me in this space. And so I was going to give it to like some sort of institution. Uh, but he was like, listen, this is yours, you know how to do it, you know how to do events, because I did that at Croker Spot as well. Um, you know how to create spaces that people enjoy. Um, and I was like, well, but I'm broke though. And, <laughs> he was like, and so he's like, we'll sponsor you. And so, you know, when I think about what roots mean and like that foundation and how a foundation can offer a springboard, uh, Croker Spot ended up offering this springboard uh, for me to kind of move into this next phase of my life, which was, uh, Africana. And so those are just a couple of the experiences that I think fed me and gave me the confidence and the support. My family was extremely supportive um, that I needed to kind of transition to this space. And then Richmond really did show up for it. Um, and that made it even easier. So, I mean, the, 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 the Kroger spot is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, restaurant, but a place of culture, you know, of, as you as you describe it, of 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 music and and images on the walls and and yeah. and so many things. So that that sort of um, uh, that fact of culture and community or culture and like hospitality, like going together. Yes. Uh, I mean, that's. I mean, way a through line into how you've done Africana and other things, right? Absolutely, because I mean, it's th it's those things. I think I carry just that mindset with me. You know, creating hospitable spaces, places for people to break bread with one another, uh, to yes, be surrounded and hopefully immersed by uh, black culture for me. Um, and it's through those things that I saw community being built. Most certainly at Croker Spot, you know, you have. You have your regulars, right? You have these people that come in and there's just a level of warmth and familiarity and like it's a, you kind of craft this familial um, bond with people. And I feel like that's something that has just kind of naturally traveled with me in the way that I do Africana. Um, I like to create spaces. Sometimes we're in big auditoriums like this or VMFA, but a lot of times we're in really intimate spaces. Um, we're going to always have us a glass of wine. We're going to always have a little something to munch on, and we're going to always have a conversation um, because I think that any time that we can purposefully get to know each other a little bit better, right? Um, understand something that maybe we didn't understand before and develop some level of community is really important. So uh, I use film as a catalyst for that. So, so maybe, uh, you know, maybe not everybody here has had a chance to attend um, Africana in the past. It's going to be year five woo -woo. In, in September. Yes. It's amazing. Um, maybe you should just like say a little bit about the different elements that, that uh, you know, comprise the program over the th three, four days that it takes place. So uh, Africana started back in like 2013, 2014, and we started with something called Noir Cinema, where we just screened one short film at an art gallery, a different art gallery each month. That would be followed by a talk with that filmmaker and a conversation. From there, because uh, that allowed me to get my feet wet, because again, I didn't have a background in film. This allowed me to meet filmmakers. This allowed me to get to know the spaces in the city and to really see if Richmond was even interested in this idea, just because I thought they were doesn't mean that they were. Um, and so 
From there, we started to develop more programming. So we do this thing called Evening with an Icon. We've been able to bring some really amazing uh, people to the city like uh, Sonia Sanchez and Angela Davis. Uh, we've, then we moved into our multi-day film festival uh, and that's what we're about to celebrate the five year of. And with that, um, we kind of kick off on a Thursday. There's a reception with a film and a talk. Uh, Friday, we come to a beautiful space like this, screen a spotlight film, uh, followed by a panel discussion and again a conversation. And then Saturday is our full day of programming where we kind of do a bit of a takeover of the Richmond Arts District. We host in all the different art galleries and um, we have filmmakers to come from everywhere. And they're on these panels, they do these talkbacks and it's just a really good time. We do another spotlight event in the evening and then we party because we love to have a good time at Africana. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, that's just like a quick rundown. But, you know, at the end of the day, Africana, no matter what space we create, whether it be the ones that I've shared with you, movies and mimosas, Starry Night Cinema, it's all designed to center black narratives and to be able to give a more full representation of what black life is like. A lot of times through mainstream media, we see a very finite view of what it means to live as a black person in any particular place um, in the world. And so Africana is designed to kind of destroy some of the tropes associated with that very limited uh, way of thinking or way of viewing uh, black life. Um, and then to just honor it and respect it by being honest about what it is because it's so multifaceted. It has so many layers. I mean, it looks like everybody else's life. You know, it's not a monolith. And so um, what I seek to do through Africana is use film as um, an opportunity to broaden perspectives, destroy tropes, and connect people. Do you want to say a bit about some of the other, other things you're doing? It's like Black RVA is happening and some oh, other yeah. stuff that parallel to this? Yes. So. Um, so I do a couple of different things. Um, so uh, Black RVA, AKA BLK RVA, uh, is this new initiative through uh, Rich and Region Tourism. And it's designed to elevate black business, right? Black entrepreneurship. And for me, it's extremely exciting uh, because when we think about roots, um, Richmond has been a place that for a long time, no one cared about it. It was a place that you drove through on 95. Um, it was a place where you were trying to figure out how you were gonna leave it when you graduated, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, you know, it, 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 it was nothing really you know, happening um, because so much of our history was rooted in the ugly, right? It was rooted in the reality of slavery. It was rooted in the reality of Jim Crow. It was, it was just a really hard space to navigate because that line of segregation was still so thick, even in like the 80s and 90s when I grew up. And you saw the remnants of that in a dilapidated downtown, in a lack of investment in the city. Um, but you still had black people, because most of you all probably know, Richmond is a 50% black city. Um, and those people have been here for decades. and. They have, there's always been black entrepreneurship, black creativity uh, working, and I saw that growing up. That was a part of my foundation. And so through uh, BLK RVA, what we have the opportunity to do is create a platform that elevates the work that they're doing with the resources of an institution behind it uh, to ensure that as Richmond continues to grow and evolve and those roots begin to kind of branch out and sprout, um, that the people who have been working on this city the whole time also get an opportunity to shine and be included in that narrative. Because we found that as Richmond became RVA, there were certain contributions that were being excluded. And so this is an opportunity for us to center those contributions and make them just as important as everybody else's. Uh, and so, and so for me, you know, as a person from Richmond, um, I feel like that's a duty. You know, I'm given the opportunity to do it, and you know, I'm proud of that work um, because, again, I come from a background in the entrepreneurial space. My father's an entrepreneur. Um, you know, I come from a family of just you know workers and grinders and doers, and I want to be able to celebrate that. Um, and so, yeah, um, BLK is an initiative that I think hopefully will strengthen and deepen the roots of our city so that we can become further integrated and 
continue to celebrate one another um, with a level of equity. Uh, I do something called Dinah en Blanc. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we basically take over a random space. Uh, everyone dresses in white. They bring out some food. We bring out some music. And we just have a good time for a few hours. Um, one of the things about Richmond, um, as I talk about that, um, that line of segregation, while it's certainly like becoming thinner and thinner, and we're becoming a more um, yeah, like integrated and supported city. Um, one of the things that I don't see a lot, we don't party a lot together, not yet. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, uh, Denon Blanc is an opportunity for people from everywhere. I mean, people come from around the world for this thing. It's, it's kind of like uh, creative mornings in that um, it, there are multiple chapters of it that happen around the world. But people have come from around the world to so come to the one here in Richmond, because Richmond is so popping right now. Um, and what we hope to do with that is create a space that allows people from all different corners and walks of life to come and party together. Because I think that creating that social space helps to strengthen the roots, too. It's important to have these conversations, to have talks, and you know, community, town halls, and all that. But sometimes you just, you really develop relationship through a good time. Who did I have a nice glass of wine with, a good beer with? Who did I laugh with? And those things mean something. And so we think Denon Blanc is an opportunity to do that. OK, what about you and the ICA? Let's have a word about that. Oh, okay, so I might work here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can say whatever you like. So, um, no, I, because you know, the, the continuity of creativity in this city is so important to you. Yeah. And you know, the honoring of uh, you know, all the creativity that's, that's been and, and, and continues. And so when you come to work at a place that's so new and just looks so different, mm. even just architecturally from, from everything else in the city, Indeed. I mean, it's, it kind of poses some, some questions in a way. How do you how do, you do create continuity and, and sort of inclusion in a place which is, so, which is so different? I mean, this is getting towards stuff that we talk about all the all time. All the time, right? yeah. Um, so we do like, we, we refer to ourselves as a little spaceship on the corner. And, you know, this place is a clear departure from any architecture that's happening anywhere in Richmond. And with that, there are some pros because it's easy to identify. There's also some cons because we don't have a sign. So people don't know quite what it is, right? They might ride by and like, what is that spaceship on the corner? Um, but also because of the architecture, you know, Richmond is a brick city, you know, so it's red, it's warm, you know, it's something, you know, and we're familiar with that. This is something totally different. Um, and so I think, um, and I mean, I probably get on people's nerves with this here too, but I think that the hospitality piece is important, right? I think because the outside can be maybe perceived as cold, it's important to be extremely warm and hospitable when you come in. Because I think that, again, is how uh, you build community. And in addition to doing that, it's about the programming. It's about the art that's in the galleries. It's about the things that happen here. It's about the conversations that we're having online so that people understand that this institution, and it genuinely is, it is, it is truly becoming this. It is a real institution that is for everyone. It's genuinely for the people. Um, I'm excited to be here at this time. We're one of the newest contemporary art institutions in the world, which is like amazing that that's here in Richmond. Um, it's here in Richmond, the newest <laughs> art institution in the world. Like that's crazy. Um, but I think that because Richmond, because Virginia, we are talking about one of the oldest places in the country when we look at it through the lens of the US has a lot of history, has a lot of work that it's doing and has to continue to do. Um, how does this place that's a global place insert itself within it, um, allowing itself to be its global place, but like connecting to community to strengthen its roots? How do we pour into Richmond's roots and help it to evolve? And that's something that we're, we're learning, that we're figuring out. But I think that it's really about creating space for community and connection that is first and foremost. Uh, and then the art and then the programming behind that. And then, you know, so we're talking about roots, but then, you know, you've also started to talk more about branches also, right? For, your, for yourself, from your own yeah. point of view. And which is to say, you, this is kind of what you get into, what you just said, you know, how 
what's happening here connects to the rest of the world and how the rest of the world connects to what could happen here. And we were talking about this in the context of looking ahead at the program you're doing even you're going to be doing even like this year and into next year. Yeah. So how does that, say more about how that, that's, uh, that's going through your mind right now as you think about branches and roots. First, I want to say I'm so Richmond that I thought he said brunches. And I was like, <laughs> but yeah, brunch is great. Like, we are thinking about a brunch thing. That too. Um, that too. Yeah. <laughs> that's how Richmond I am. Um, but uh, yeah, so branches. So. <laughs> Um, so in thinking about this, you know, when I was thinking about like, well, what will I say? Um, cause my nerves are terrible. My, I'm sh my nerves are shot in being uh, in settings like this. Like what, what are the sort of things I want to talk about? And I was thinking so much about the, uh, the graphic that was designed around roots. And I, then I was like, well, what are roots really designed to do? You know, they're really designed to like strengthen the tree so that these branches can thrive and, um, Richmond is certainly at a place where it is branching out, right? It is respecting its foundation, acknowledging that it, we got some really kind of rotten roots up in there that we have to correct, we got to prune, we got to acknowledge those. Um, but we also have some really healthy ones uh, and we're nurturing and, and watering those. And I think that is allowing us as a city to just like branch out in the way that we do things, the way that we think, the way we present ourselves, the way that the world is seeing us. Um, and that's uh, super exciting. And then for me, you know, I feel like I'm in the same kind of process. Um, I turned 40 in November, and thank you. And it's something about 40 that has brought a level of clarity that I didn't have at 39. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm seeing myself, you know, a little bit differently, um, just as a person and the way I want to move through the world and acknowledging that I do want to move through the world. That just because Richmond, I like I love Richmond, like I'll carry it on my back. Um, and Richmond has made me the person that I am and I think that it's given me a really strong foundation. But I think that there's something special about carrying Richmond with me out into different uh, corners. Uh, and so I'm excited to be able to kind of move into different spaces and take all that Richmond has been able to pour into me um, as I make further connections and it begin to introduce people to the beauty of Richmond. Because as the more I talk to people and like let them know all that Richmond has going on, the history that we are shifting away from, you know, we're talking about a former home of the Confederacy, but we're also talking about a rich black experience. Uh, we are we have Jackson Ward and Two Street and the legacy of Maggie Walker and John Mitchell Jr. and people like that. And these are people that folks don't understand their level of contribution to the world in which we live. And so I think it's time to kind of for me to branch out a bit and tell the Richmond narrative outside of here. Because I think as people know that the oldest place in the country is changing like swiftly and intentionally into the place that we're becoming, which I think is a beautiful place, um, I think it'll give other places inspiration to realize that they can do it too. Um, they can do the hard work. So, so yeah. So maybe like just to, to, to wrap up, do you want to say a bit about some things you're looking forward to in 2020? Could be like Africana 5 or some ICA film stuff. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> next, next I week might be or ready. Yeah. Um, so I mean, actually 2020 is, um, is really exciting. Um, so I have a son. Uh, he's 16. Uh, he's finishing up his junior year. Uh, so he'll be moving into his senior year in 2020. So like that's heavy on my mind. College, what's next for him? Uh, what kind of foundation have I laid for him and the people around him uh, laid for him as he moves uh, out into the world? So that's one of the things that's heavy on my mind for 2020. Um, but then also in terms of the work that I'm doing, uh, I'll start here. So Africon, I mean, excuse me, ICA. Uh, everyone should have gotten one of these. Uh, so this is our spring program. Super excited about it. Um, we, I think last season, if anyone came to any of our programming, you will see that we are really like working to bring dope fly programming to this city. And people all over are writing about it. New York Times and Hyperallergenic and all these people are like taking note of what we are doing 
in Richmond uh, in this place. And so I'm, hype, I'm, I'm extremely excited um, about everything that we're doing here. We have something coming up on Monday and Tuesday, MLK Monday and the National Day of Racial Healing on Tuesday. We're bringing Blitz, the ambassador. He's a Ghanaian musician uh, and filmmaker. Uh, he'll be here doing a film screening and a concert and a master class, all kinds of dope stuff. So we invite you to come back on Monday at three o'clock if you can. Um, then also Africana, uh, as Dominic said, we turn five as a multi-day. Looking forward to um, bringing some amazing black filmmakers to Richmond for another year. And we hope to see your face in the place. Because uh, even though we are here to screen black film, uh, it's really conversation for everybody. These stories are for everyone. You know, as we center them, we seek to normalize them. Right, so that's the reality of that. So don't think that when someone says, oh, it's Black Restaurant Week, it's a Black Film Festival, it's Black entrepreneurship, that only Black people can live in that space. We're here to be supported and create community with everyone, so please, you know, um, know that. Uh, Denon Blanc's coming back, and yeah. There's probably some more stuff. All right, so we have a little bit of time for some questions. Yeah. So I'd love to let, if anyone in the audience has something burning they'd like to ask Anjali. Yes. Okay. Okay. Do you have a date of when it's going to happen in 2020? Africana? Yes. Yes, uh, September, the week of the 16th, weekend of the 16th. Okay. Yeah. So come on through. <laughs> Yes. As a, as a native Richmonder, I want to get your perspective on this. As, as far as we've come, even since I've been here, even in the last decade, I still see two sides, right? There's the, you know, even geographically, there's the West End and there's the East End, right? And, and by financially and, and sociologically, it's entirely different. And how are we, how, how far do you feel like we have to go and how far have we come? to not only integrating like racially, but also really becoming one community. Because there's a lot of people that are getting left behind. Well, the reality is that Richmond is a gentrified space, right, from corner to corner. And there are aspects to you know, this revitalized Richmond that we live in that are positive. Um, Africana couldn't have lived. Most of the things that most of my friends are doing that look like me couldn't have lived in the Richmond that I grew up in. However, the underbelly to that is the reason that I say BLK is important, because people get left out, right? And so I think it's important that as we grow, that we're mindful. I feel like Richmond, the truth is, I feel like Richmond missed an opportunity, right? There have been gentrified cities across this nation, and as we moved into a city that wanted to uh, redefine, uh, reintroduce itself, um, we could have been a lot more thoughtful in the way that we did it, right? And so as we invited VCU students to stay, as we invited VCU to expand throughout the city, um, there were ways that we, there were models that we could have created and also followed um, that allow for us to be thoughtful in that transition so we created space for everybody. We chose not to do it because, you know, America and money and all those things. Um, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, you know, I think that all that we can, we can't put the genie back in the bottle. We are where we are. Um, but I think that it does require people being honest, uh, people who have moved into Churchill to be honest about what that means for property value and people who are gone, people who have moved, who are moving into Northside to be honest about what that means. And we have to... I don't, I don't know how to fix that fiscally, right? But I know in terms of community, it'll, it'll mean not calling the police on your neighbors. It'll mean not posting crazy stuff in next door, right? It'll mean being uh, thoughtful and mindful that oftentimes you are the visitor, you're the new person there, and the onus is on you to go out and meet your neighbor and create that sense of community. So I think some of it is just around responsibility, individual responsibility, right? And acknowledging what you're stepping into. Because it's not one person, it's nobody's fault per se. It's a system. 
But if you know you're operating within that system, how can you as an individual step in and make a change? And I think that's about person-to-person -person connection. And so I think it's just about personal accountability. The rest of it's a much bigger conversation. I have one last question for you. Hey, Michelle. Um, you are not a filmmaker, you said this. I am not. Yet you have undertaken some pretty amazing creative endeavors in all of your work. So I really want to hear about your thoughts on creativity for change. Oh, I think it's necessary. I think you have to be a creative thinker to even change a thing, right? You have to be looking and saying, okay, this may work fine, but it could work better. This is broken, how can we fix it? So that requires this, you know, a fundamental level of creative thought. Um, but I think that creativity in terms of the artistic expression and platforms that we create, um, I think that they help in kind of speaking to what this gentleman was talking about because they allow you to surface issues, um, maybe in a way that can, sometimes be a little lighter, but still connect to the heart space in the way that it needs to. Because really the shifts that we're talking about, they do require um, head space and hand space, but they, it starts with the heart space actually caring, caring to change it, right? And so I think that creativity sometimes, creative spaces can relax the heart space and allow things to permeate in a way that will say, okay, well, now you start to think about, well, what can I do to change it? And once you think about that thing, what can I do? What actions can I put into place to change it? And so I think that creative spaces are extremely important. Richmond has grown into a tremendously creative community. I do think there's still some level of divide in the Richmond creative community. Um, like, I, I wanna see this room be a little more, di you know, to be a little more diverse, right? Um, I think that when I posted about uh, creative mornings in my stories, there were people like, well, what's that? There are so many people on my side of the creative uh, Richmond that don't know what it is. So we just still have to, I think there's about, there's a communication gap. So the creativity is happening, and I think that the desire for everyone to participate is there, but there is a bridge in the communication. And so we have to figure out how to fill that gap. Um, but I think the work, the creative work is extremely important. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Angela.